Welcome back to another podcast. Today on All Things Phantomworks, our guest is a man that um, is uh, several generations, we'll find out how many he is, um, a butcher. Um, he makes, without a doubt, the best summer sausage, the best Smokies, and the best beef jerky I have ever had. And on top of that, um, the steaks, the uh, the cuts, the uh, pork, uh, the the bacon slabs that this man produces. Um, I, I don't know you. I, I could describe it all day long, but until you've actually uh, thrown some of this on the grill, uh, on on the pan on your stove, um, you you really wouldn't have an appreciation for how good it is until you've actually experienced it. And so uh, the man's name is uh, Red Lair. He is in a small butcher shop in New Athens, Illinois. We, we have agreed that Illinois probably should have the S pronounced again, so we do call it Illinois. Um, a really tiny little town, like super tiny, and yet has this amazing butcher shop that I wish we had in Hampton Roads, and we don't. Uh, welcome, Red, uh, to All Things Phantom Works. Um, it's good to have you on the show today. And uh, look, the reason we contacted you is... Um, you, you've been my butcher for years now. Um, yep. uh, you know, we, we, we met on Route 66. You helped us out. Uh, you provided us some steaks. And since then, uh, I've, I've been making the journey to New Athens, Illinois, for uh, the, the world's greatest steaks. And, and you've actually come out to my place, too, to, to help me um, through a few processes. So I, I wanted to talk to you and dispel some myths and and maybe confirm some truths about being a butcher. So, um, yep. some quick information. How how big is the town you're in? About two thousand people. There's two thousand people in that little town. Well, it changes from nineteen hundred to two thousand about every other year. But wow. it's so small we have to take turns being the town fool. So okay, okay. Yeah. all right, all right. Because I, I, I would have thought there must be about six families living in every home. I didn't think there were that many homes in your town. Um, and and so for me it was a little odd to see a butcher shop kind of as big as you are in a town as small as it is. Um, because yeah. because you're an actual butcher shop. And and by the way, I define a butcher shop as you take the animal from the hoof to the freezer wrap. And you do that, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Did Work you finish. did you know that in my area in South Eastern Virginia, I am unaware that there is a single butcher that actually kills, processes, and sells mm -hmm. beef uh, within about a hundred miles of me. Not a single one. So you don't have anywhere to take what you raise and have it processed. Anyway. If if it exists, someone needs to show me where it is. And I've asked the question at multiple events, and everyone tells me there is no one around. In in fact, I found a butcher shop in Virginia Beach, and I went to visit the butcher shop, and I said to them, "Finally, I found a butcher shop. Where do you do the processing of the animal?" They said, "Now nah, we we order frozen sides of beef from Nebraska, and we uh, just do the final cutting here." So. There is nowhere that I'm aware of in Hampton Roads. And, and we got 1.4 million people. You've got a town of 2,000 and you got a butcher. We got 1.4 million people. We have none. There's a little, and, little odd. And I, I don't understand. I don't know. Maybe it's because we're in the Midwest where I don't know if there's more beef raised up here than there would be down there. Well, I mean, you guys still live in caves and, you know, run around with spears and chase woolly mammoths. So I'm guessing that's the reason. That would be part of it. Yeah. 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 You learn you learn quickly. But uh, but, you know, almost every town up this way had a meat market of some sorts. Every small town and a lot of the towns are within 20 minutes of here, maybe, you know, but every town had a, a, a butcher processing plant and and would you call a butcher shop i would qualify one as having a kill floor would you agree with that statement yes okay yes. so in other words if somebody else kills gut skins and does all that stuff i don't consider them a butcher they're just sort of a meat processor processor is right now that's okay it. they're just processing all right 
Yeah. So, so here the, the the reason you're on the show today is because, look, I, I I moved off grid about three years ago and have very very rapidly I think sort of gone from you know a couple chickens to some goats to some pigs to some turkeys and ducks and dogs and cats and bees to finally cows that I'm now processing and making my own food for the cows and then processing milk. Uh, last night, I made nine pounds of cheddar cheese. Um, really? Yeah, it took me till 11 o'clock at night because I, I worked and then went home. And so it was 11 o'clock at night. And I will admit that I didn't do every one of the stirring processes, but I was getting tired. And five o'clock comes pretty early on the farm, you know. Oh, yeah. But you know where it came from. Exactly. So, so actually, I didn't pay you for that, but that's a perfect segue. So the first question is, and, and I'm going to ask your perspective because then I'm going to give you others. Is mm -hmm. eating beef good for you? So what say you on that basic question? Of course. Okay. Of course. We're all, that's, it all started with, with carnivores. I mean, absolutely. All yeah. right. And, and I recently heard, and I've, I've got to do a little bit of research and, you know, who, who knows how, what that'll gain me, but they say that the brain of the Homo sapien stayed fairly small until we went from being herbivores, you know, plant eaters, to carnivores and started eating meat. And at the time we started eating meat, our brains grew significantly and we got much smarter. Um, have you ever heard of that? I have never heard of that. Okay, so this maybe, is, <clears throat> yeah, maybe you, news. Yeah, maybe you got a new logo for your pray, place, right? Eat, eat meat, get a bigger brain. Some, something yeah. like that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Educated consumers. All right. So yeah. so here's, look, my son is a diehard, grass-fed, grass-finished uh, only. And, and, <clears throat> and my understanding, grass-fed means that at least part of their diet is grass. Grass-finished means all of their diet is always grass. Is that right. your understanding? That is my understanding. They are pastured, you know, pasture-fed. Yeah. You know, they don't get they don't get any grain whatsoever. So is that a yeah. good thing or a bad thing? To me, it's a bad thing because you can't fatten. But go ahead. No, you, no, no. I'm, I'm listening. Why? You can't really fatten cattle on just pasture and grass or even hay. They don't get enough en enough. The, the corn is what gets them the fat, putting the fat in the meat and the and the muscle on they've got to have the you know on a cell feeder that's the idea in the big feedlots these cattle are on self feeders at a certain point you know from a certain weight and they've got all they want to eat all day long and that's to me what makes good good beef so one of the things and 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 forgive me i haven't done research into this but if a cow is pasture raised and eating just grass, um, mm -hmm. I, I am told two things. Number one, that a cow gets almost no calories from the gra from the grass, and in fact, it's gut bacteria as a result of grass fermenting, um, fermenting that actually creates the 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 calories. But the other thing I'm I'm worried about or concerned about is how much protein is there in a blade of grass? Not much that I know of. I've never done the, never looked at it, but, you know, there's a reason why they fatten cattle for years and years and years on ground corn or, you know, on corn. And, yeah, I don't think there's much in there at all. So I feed my cattle a diet of probably 80% grass and 20% grain, and that grain mm -hmm. is primarily corn. Mm -hmm. Is that, am I, am I doing the right thing, wrong thing, somewhere in between? Depends on what you're wanting to get out of it. If you're milking yeah. this, your animal, that's fine. That's fine. When I was milking, they got mostly pasture and hay, some silage, and the only ground feed they really got was at milking time. And that was a shovel full of grain. That's it. For producing for producing milk, if you're gonna raise this beef to eat yourself, and you want something good, 
and you want it of a substantial size, you've almost got to feed it corn to get it big enough in 18 to 20 months. If you don't feed it the corn, the stuff that it takes, you know, the minerals, the, you know, whatever, whatever you're putting in your feed, if you don't give it enough of that, you're going to wind up waiting until this beef, it's going to be on pasture, no grain. It's going to take probably two and a half to maybe even, a, you know, a couple of years at least to get that beef big enough. And all there's going to be is mostly frame. There's not a lot of flesh oh. on an animal that is pasture or grass fed. And I, we killed two of them this week for a, a, a farmer friend who brought two cattle in and there's not much fat on it. So are they all, all. they're all grass fed? The, both of these cattle were grass fed. Yep. What, is, is the beef, does it taste different on grass? Does it look different? Is it different or is it, does it look the same, just not as much? It, just not as much. There's little or no fat on it. And when you go, and so the fat is what helps that beef give give it some stability. Wait, wait a second. The, the fat is what gives it the flavor, isn't it? And the flavor. Yep, I mean, yep. we I, getting... I, I learned years ago, I no longer cut the fat out of my beef. I eat the fat along with the beef. I'm not saying it's just a monster bite of fat, but I, I no longer trim all the fat off my beef. I actually eat most of the fat. You have to have fat for flavor, and these cattle don't have any. And when you go to cut it on the saw, it's like cutting a, a huge 50-pound rubber band. There is nothing that holds it and keeps it stable while you're trying to cut it, and it's, there's, and there's no, no marbling whatsoever. And really? No marbling. No. It is just red meat and... That's all there is. It's just no fat, literally no fat. That burger will probably be 90, 95% lean when we grind it because there's no fat. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so, so it doesn't sound like you're a fan of grass fed, grass finished beef. Not a big fan. I get calls for it and I can find them if I want to. And, uh, and I do from time to time. Okay. That's what they want. I've got certain customers. That's what they want, and that's what I get them. So, yeah. oh, okay. So, Red, I I bought two cows from you, not at the same time, and and mm -hmm. in fact, if you remember, I I helped you do a little bit of the butchering. And and by the oh. way, let me let me explain. That was a humbling experience. Um, I I mean, to, sounding like a sissy, but one of the times I came up, I'd just been out of hand surgery about a week before. I got to tell you, I, I tried not to complain, but I, I was dying. I had no idea just how much hand and arm strength it takes for, for you and your team to, to take a cow, a beef, and, and process a beef. That was actually quite amazing to me. Yeah. Um, and the, you the did amount of work good, you though. did. Oh, and you did good. You only cut yourself, nicked yourself one yeah. time. Yeah. I, 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 that was... Part of the blood on the table was mine, yeah. <laughs> and that was good yeah yeah um so but you wonder go ahead so the 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 cow the cows that i got from you because mm -hmm. you know that there's an interesting theory i i've i've been reading some papers by universities and they say there's absolutely no problem with all the hormones steroids pesticides and everything else that the cow ingests and, and there's a lot of other organizations that say, not true, it is bad for you. And, and I go back to the, there's a basic theory of matter, and that is matter is neither created nor destroyed, it merely changes shape. So if a cow consumes steroids, hormones, pesticides, estrogen, those things are all in the cow's system. And when I eat that cow, it's in me. So... Are the cows that I got from you filled with all those chemicals? No, and that's why I buy them from the guy that I buy them from. I've been buying cattle from the same person for about 35 years. Okay. 35 years, and you're eating the same thing that I'm eating. Okay. That's so the same stuff that I take home, but I know for a fact that he doesn't, you know, you know he doesn't do the hormone injections. And 
the pesticides, you're, you're not going to get away from that. It, yeah. There's going to be a certain amount no matter what you do. Yeah, no, because it's everywhere. It's it's in the drinking water. That's another whole EPA issue. You know, no matter what you do, it's around. It, you just okay. don't know to what extent. Okay, so so how concerned are you? And, and the reason I bring this up is I recently met a woman who she her doctor took her off of meats because how much estrogen was in the meat causing her she had like a stage 3 breast cancer and and the doctors believed that it was the estrogen in the meat that was causing it and 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 interestingly this article that talked about it and let me just tell you who wrote it it was from um uh oh South Dakota. The South Dakota okay. State article said it's not a big deal, but then they went on to say, but high estrogen content in meat actually is a problem. So the article almost seemed to um, disagree with itself. So how, how concerned are you about all of this stuff in our meat? I'm not concerned about you. If you're referring to the estrogen, yeah, I've never... All- I've never heard i've never heard of that before with the you know with a you know with a high estrogen level in it i don't know if what they were being fed you know what were they testing you know what meat is it that they were testing that would be what i would ask where was it from you know blah 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 so can kind of a thing can we agree that maybe if you go to a small butcher like lair's meat uh lair's meat shop in new athens illinois that you might be getting smaller farms, smaller beef production plant than, say, a major cattle farm, and and is it possible that you have less of those chemicals in your in your beef than they do? I would say, yeah, there'd be a good chance it would be less. You know, it's those the cattle that are going through, and like people in the city, they're buying beef. That was raised out in a big feed lot wherever they're at. They're they're all over the place. Nebraska, you name it, Kansas. There's big feed lots everywhere. And they're being raised out in these big feed lots. So, you know, there's no grass out there, that's for sure. Not in the yeah. feed lots. So, you know, they're well, can, probably I, I'm, as, I'm assuming in those big feed lots, there's a lot of growth hormones in their food, wouldn't there be? I'm not going to say one way or okay. another all right. All right. Yeah. To, not to incriminate myself, but I, I honestly, gosh, don't know. But there's a reason why cattle get big fast. Okay. All right. You and it, it, it isn't just fresh air. All right. right. So, so here's then, then I'm just going to say what I think and you can either choose to agree or disagree or just remain silent to protect yourself. <laughs> I believe okay. that if an animal is being fed growth hormones to make them much larger, much faster, that ultimately those hormones are resident in the in the tissues of that animal. And if I go eat it, then those hormones become resident in me and they're going to have some effect on my body. I would say that's correct. Okay. I haven't not having any study proof in front of me, but I would say, you know, over and over you keep eating the same wow. stuff from the same place yeah i would say that's true all right so so yeah. here's my takeaway from the first part if and when possible buy your beef or raise your beef with as like like my beef gets no hormones no we right. have no pesticides on our property nothing so what right. they're eating is natural grass and all the grain i feed them is not only mm-hmm. organic, but it has no growth hormones in it. I'm, I'm sure, like you say, there's probably a little bit of pesticides in something, but that would probably be the extent of what my animals get. So I, Correct. I think they're eating quite healthy. All right. So, no, so I'm, I'm going to stay small. It's probably a little bit more expensive, but I'm going to stay small rather than mega corporation when it comes to buying my, my meats. Yep. That's okay. Way. So let's talk about what it costs, because I got to tell you, Red, I was at um, Walmart about a year ago, 
and I went to do something goofy. I went into Walmart to buy a steak. Uh, there was no butcher shop in this little town I was in. There was a Walmart. And I walk in and we're picking up, you know, the normal really good stuff, the hot dogs, you know, all that really nutritious stuff. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah. I, I went over to the beef rack and they had T-bones on sale mm -hmm. for $26 a pound. Wow. So, Wait. yeah, I was a little I was a little floored by that. But even my my local Smithfield um, store, you know, hamburger is routinely six to ten dollars a pound. So what I would like to know is. Is the cost of beef reasonable? So can we run through, um, and I want to use simple numbers, a thousand yeah. pound animal so that we can do right. simple math. And, and by the way, is a thousand pound animal kind of a, is that a reasonable beef to butcher? It used to be. Years ago, that's farmers very rarely got them much over a thousand pounds. Now they're wanting the packing plants are wanting these cattle up around 14 to 1500 pounds. They want big steaks. They want big roasts, you know? Okay. That's the reason why, but a thousand pounds is a great weight to kill a beef. Oh, okay. So we'll just say using natural sun and food, a thousand pounds is a good weight. Maybe if you're doing something on natural, 1500 pounds is a good weight. Would that be fair? <laughs> That'd be fair. All right, fair yeah. enough. So, so we're going to take a thousand pound animal. All right. So, the mm -hmm. first thing you got to do once the animal is is has been killed is yep. I'm guessing you're going to cut the the you're going to skin it, gut it, and what else do you do right off the bat? What are what's the first processing you do before you hang it? Roll it out. You take the head off. The head will come off. It'll lay on its back, and you start the skinning process. Split it right down the middle, the feet come off, the head comes off, and then you start the process of peeling it down and skinning it. Okay. So yep. we take a thousand pound animal and we kin it, kill it, we gut it, mm -hmm. skin it, and uh take the head and feet off. What does that animal weigh at this point, approximately? Roughly six hundred pounds. Okay, so we've lost well animal. we've lost four hundred pounds. Before we've even started butchering. Yep. Okay. Before you've started, even started cutting. You All know. right. And I'm assuming that animal at that point probably gets what? Turned into two sides and hung in the refrigerator. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And how long will it yep. hang for in a refrigerator? At our place, roughly 10 days. Seven okay. To seven, seven to 10 days. So I, I guess that's the aging of the beef? Yeah. Yeah, and that's a whole nother subject too. Now, does that way. matter? If 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 you and I were to get together and we found a rogue cow out in the woods and we were hungry and we we went ahead and you know killed a thousand pound beef and we gutted it, skinned it, cut its head off, cut the feet off, and then we made steaks right then, would they still be good or would they not be good? After it's been chilled overnight, they the day after it they'd be fine. And you, you do you have to chill it overnight? It makes it a lot easier to cut steaks off of it, yeah. Oh, because otherwise, otherwise the, it's like the meat's too rubbery, isn't it? If you go yeah. right. Yeah. You could oh. do it. Technically, you could do that. You could start chopping pieces off and, and cutting it up and, and eating it. Yeah. Okay, so just but, really quickly, why do we age beef then? What does aging do? There is bacteria good what's called good bacteria in the beef okay in our bodies has our bodies have good and bad bacteria the bacteria well, yours has bad bacteria i'm pretty sure mine has mostly good bacteria but <laughs> but 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 we'll i digress keep going <laughs> but anyway the bacteria the natural bacteria that's in there starts breaking down the meat fiber and that's the whole premise in aging beef the longer okay. it hangs, the bacteria keeps breaking down and breaking down and breaking down the meat fiber. So it makes it now, more tender? Makes it more tender. So is, was, if two weeks is good, is four weeks better? Depends on your climate control that you have in your in your place. You have to have the very the, the optimum climate control to be able to do that with your beef. Uh, for instance, I was at a steakhouse, one of the top five steakhouses in uh, in the United States down at Tampa, 
and they took me when they found out I was a meat cutter butcher. They took me back and showed me actually took me in the aging cooler. And I saw it was just phenomenal, phenomenal. There is beef that had hung for our pieces, the uh, short lines where you get the T-bones from, had been there for over a month. And they age in it, and it's got a perfect climate control, and it's wonderful, wonderful stuff. So that little that, bit of trimming on the outside. See, I would have thought that it was because – because look, you leave hamburger in your refrigerator for a week, and it might even start smelling bad. So, oh, yeah. how, how does yeah. how does beef sit in a refrigerator for a month and not go bad? You've got to have the right climate, the right humidity, the right temperature, and a lot of a lot of fat. They leave all the fat on oh. this, so, so that when it changes comes, the equation. Oh yeah, the fat. They leave all the fat on it. Yeah. Oh okay. All right, so let's go so on with my, in case. So we, we've got our 600 pounds of beef hanging in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. We're going to age it for a couple of weeks or a month, depending on if we're in Tampa, Florida, or, or Illinois, or Illinois. Um, Illinois. Illinois. And uh, so now we're going to take it out and we're going to butcher it. So at this point, you haven't cut the fat off it yet, and really the bones are all still in it, right? Correct. So, so that's yep. kind of what the process is. So when we talk about butchering, can mm -hmm. we simplify it by just saying cutting the fat and bone out of the meat, essentially? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So if I take this 600-pound beef and I butcher it, how much is going to be left when I finish cutting out the fat and the bone that I don't want? Approximately 38%, possibly. So are you saying that I'm going to have less than – so of the total animal that started out at 1,000 pounds, I'm down to only 380 pounds of animal left? Correct. Yeah. yeah. I've lost almost two-thirds of the animal on the floor? Yep. Yeah. That's, that's, that's how it – yeah. That's, that's crazy talk. That's the – I know. I know. A lot of people don't realize that. They don't realize how much cutting loss there is on a beef, how much bone loss there is on a beef. And everybody gets their stuff, you know, their side of beef or beef cut different. Nowadays, the trend that I'm seeing is hamburger, hamburger, hamburger. People are throwing steak into burger. Their kids won't eat nothing but hamburger. It's 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 all the kids want. It's fast. They can do everything in the world with it. You know, but, so we're, uh, we're, are you telling yeah. me we're taking steaks and turning it into hamburger? I'm telling you, we are taking good steak, grinding it into burger. Everything. Are, are you actually, uh, do people come to you with that ridiculous request? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and do yeah. you punch them first or do you just yell at them? Which one do you do? Because I would, I, I would do I, both. I, I don't ask any questions. I just, it's, it's theirs and I'll cut it any way they want. I make suggestions. I'm like, you sure this is what you want to do? And that's, the, that's all we eat is hamburger. You yeah. oh. Tell me you have never turned a ribeye into hamburger. Oh, I have. I have, and it just Okay, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I have to go. I, I, I'm going to have to go meditate for a little while and think about <laughs> Oh, okay. I, I I need a safe space no. from this, yeah. Oh yeah. You're turning no, ribeyes into hamburger. Ribeyes. I had a customer two weeks ago that threw everything into burger except for some roast. Yeah. They they yeah, turned he he fillets into burger and left roasts as roasts. Everything. I hope Even you punched that person. I hope you punched them. No. <laughs> I, I couldn't have, didn't have the heart. He was a friend. And he tried okay, to friends talk don't into, let friends turn tenderloins into hamburger. That's what I would have said to him. I know it. Oh, okay, I, we, we need bill, to go on. I'll, I'll Look, I, I'm, I, I, I really do need to save space at this point. You know, I, I, all right. Um, so, so we've only got 380 pounds. So let's just say that mm -hmm. people are normal. Out of the 380 pounds, I've got three things. I got steaks, I got roast, and I got burger, 
and and we won't count like tallow which is the leftover fat and stuff like that so out of 380 pounds mm -hmm. which isn't much out of a thousand pound animal how many how many pounds of steaks am i going to see out of 380 what and what i would call prime Ricky. cuts sirloin uh tenderloin um uh ribeye uh new york roughly the way i cut the way we cut beef you're gonna have about 30 pounds of rib steaks and this is with the bone in them okay everything i'm gonna tell you has got the bone in it roughly and this is a whole beef okay in in america we call about, that a ribeye right? i think i i know you, you folks in illinois you call them different things but we're, we're going to call that a ribeye. That's how we roll. All That's right, you can roll. roll roll your own way. We're, we're in America, by God. <laughs> That's right, by God. 75 pounds of roast, let's say, out of that beef. Probably 36, 35 pounds of T-bones. Uh, sirloins, maybe 30 pounds. Uh, rib steaks, mm, 30 pounds and maybe 35 pounds of round steak also. Round steak or what you run through the tenderizer. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Round is on the on the border of becoming a roast or a steak, right? It's that's the the cut yes. that's in the middle. Yeah, the round is well, naturally the hind leg, that's where your round steaks are. Okay. And yeah. I I I I want to make sure I understand something and I've never really understood it. Does a round steak have a different flavor than a ribeye, or is the flavor the same? It's just the tenderness that's mostly different. It's mostly the tenderness of it. The round steaks aren't the best cut, okay? Uh, top round, there's two parts to the round. There's the top and the bottom. The top round, for whatever reason, is a little bit more on the tender side. Uh, then the bottom part has got the eye of the round in there and then your bottom of the round. But the t the top round is seems to be a little more tender. And when people want to roast out of, they will, most people are grinder round steaks these days. Nobody saves round steaks, hardly at all. You cut me rounds, you cut me steaks out of my, my bottom round or and ra eye of the round. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I, cause I, yeah. I was going to punch you in the face if you tried to make tenderloin and hamburger which is what you should do but in this case yeah so so round can be steaks just like they can be roast right even bottom round correct correct the round can be made i think we cut you some thick ones oh yeah uh, like oh. an inch or inch or so no 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 you are mistaken my friend inch is what inch. i would consider a steakum which belongs on a piece of bread with some meat on it if if a steak is less than about one and three quarter inch thick, it is not worth grilling. It just didn't worth it. So <laughs> well, that's true. And I learned that very quickly from you folks down in the Norfolk area. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> that are up up here. A chuck roast is an inch and a half thick. With Dan, we call those chuck steaks. Exactly. So. Yeah. So, yeah. so, yeah. So I won't go into what I had because I got almost everything in steaks. You made almost nothing in roast. So, so you gave me some numbers. Right. So would we be safe saying probably somewhere between 80 and a hundred pounds of steak out of that uh, 380? Close. Yeah. Oh. Close to that. You got 35, 30. And, and if you're going to count the round steaks, if you're going to count steaks, you got to count them all. So yeah, probably a little over a hundred. Okay, about 100 pounds of steak. Yeah, a little over. How much roast? You said about 85 pounds of roast? 75-ish if you cut them three pounds. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then about so, 170, 170 pounds of burger. I was going to say, so, that that would leave, by my math, close to 200 pounds of hamburger. It, but you have, there's one more factor in there, and that's the soup bones. You know, a lot of people don't want them. But that's something that comes with the beef are soup bones, you know, bones that you cannot get all of the meat off of. That would be right. good to take home, make broth and that out of. You've got to count that in there. So there would be somewhere around 20 pounds of bones on that whole beef. So that has to kind of go into the equation. OK, so out of that 380 so, pounds, 20 pounds of that is bones. 
is still bones. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so wait a second. So I'm, I'm doing some math and I'm a pretty simple guy when it comes to math. You're saying out of a thousand pound animal, I'm ending up with roughly 100 pounds of steak. Yeah. So That's I'm correct. only getting one pound out of 10 as a steak. And, yeah. and, and less than one pound out of 10 is a roast. Mm -hmm. and, That's correct. And around two pounds out of 10 is hamburger. Yep. That's correct. And six pounds out of 10 goes on the floor. That's correct. Hard to believe, isn't it? That it's hard to believe. A lot goes to the rendering company. Yeah, that's 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 pretty crazy. All right, so so let's just talk money. If if you you go out and like when you got me my cow, you went out and I imagine yeah. you contacted a, a a rancher and you said I want to buy a beef. So if you bought a thousand pound beef, what are you going to pay per pound? Like how much are you going to pay for a thousand pound animal? Right now, the market is around dollar seventy a pound. Okay, so you're going to pay seventeen hundred bucks for a thousand pound animal. Yeah, we're only going to get three hundred and eighty pounds of beef out of that animal. How much That's is correct. that beef going to sell? And and let's just say an average price. That way, it's it's steaks, it's roasts, it's hamburger. What's the average price that 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 beef is going to go for? Roughly seven bucks a pound, just okay. Off the so top of my head, that comes out to around twenty six, twenty seven hundred dollars ballpark. So if you're paying yeah. seventeen hundred, there's about a thousand dollars. So you it it comes in at seventeen hundred dollars. It goes in at about twenty. It goes out at about twenty seven hundred. All right. Mm -hmm. So there's about a, there's that's about nine hundred dollars actually. Nine hundred dollars difference between what you pay and what you sell for. So can we take a look at where that $900 is? Yeah. All right. Absolutely. So like when I do body work, I have a line on mine. It's called uh, tape, paper, and plastic. So you yeah. wrap up in plastic and paper and you use tape. What do you spend in tape, paper, mm -hmm. and plastic out of, out of the 900 bucks? Roughly 50. Okay. So I got 850 bucks left. I got to pay employees. I got to pay them to transport the animal, at least move it through my place, kill it, skin it, split it, hang it. After it refrigerates, then they take it and then they, they bone it. They basically cut it up and package it and mm -hmm. label it and put it in freezer wrap. What's the total cost of just the labor for that? If you had to look at employees, and, and what you're going to pay for all your employees to do one one beef? Somewhere two fifty three hundred. Okay, so most people underestimate it. I'm just going to go three hundred because people forget about payroll taxes and uh, Social Security withholdings and all that other stuff. So, so you you started with nine hundred. You went to eight fifty after you bought all your materials. Yeah. Now you're at six fifty. But now I got this nasty little thing that nobody wants to talk about, which is overhead, taxes, insurance, inspections, regulations, mortgage, uh, depreciation, equipment, maintenance, utilities, um, all of that stuff. What's your guess on, on all of your overheads combined to process that animal? I mean, you may as well just say 500 bucks right off, right off the bat. You know, when you're talking about everything. Okay. You know? And and and, and I'll just tell you that for me, I, as a rule, if I take triple whatever my labor is, that tends to average what my overhead is. Okay? Yeah. So, yeah. so for That's me, it's labor times three. And if your labor is about... See, so your overhead's actually lower than mine. So if my labor on a project, like you just said, was... Uh, 250 to 300, my overhead would be 750 to, uh, you know, 900. All right. So okay. if your overhead is 500, you've got a lower overhead rate than I do. So, so at this point, you're putting in your pocket for processing a beef somewhere between 100 and 150 bucks. Is that ballpark correct? If, if you're lucky, 
And the bad part about that is that as beef goes up, the price of live beef, what I have to pay for the beef from the farmer, when I have to pay more, your profit goes down because you can only really charge so much. I've actually had to call people back and tell them like the price went you know, from the time they called me, it might be two or three months later until we get that beef. And I have to call them back. And this actually happened. It jumped up uh, 30 cents a pound. This was during the during the uh, the COVID. The, the scamdemic. Uh, yeah. The scamdemic. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yes. So and uh, is that hoof said, weight? You went up 30 cents a pound hoof weight? Oh, no, on my price, what, what I was from my oh. price went up. So I had to, I had to pass the cost on. And every person that I called said, Hey, what are we going to do? We got to have yeah. beef. Oh, okay. You know? So and it's your customers were at least willing anybody. to play ball. Just, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. As so, long as you've got something good, they'll play it. So if if I if I finish out this math and you've made around a hundred bucks, and you're producing a little less than four hundred pounds, your markup on the beef is somewhere around twenty five to thirty five cents a pound. Would would you sort of agree with that? Yeah, yeah, that's about right. Okay, so so then riddle me this, Batman. If you're selling for seven dollars a pound, which is you're paying six seventy five a pound. You're selling at seven a pound. No, I, no one should be able to fault you for that. Why is it that I'm paying ten, fifteen, eighteen, twenty dollars a pound for many of these cuts? And and the hamburger, when you say seven dollars, and I'm looking at an average, I'm paying seven dollars a pound for hamburger, and I'm paying fifteen and twenty dollars a pound for a decent steak. So who's making all the money? Because it doesn't sound like it's you the the people who are who are selling the cuts you know they they're the ones that set the big packing houses are selling it and what what happens to it after that that's where the the charge comes in you know they're talking about I'm talking about the people that are buying the stuff from the packing house uh other butcher shops that don't kill they're just bringing stuff in and cutting yeah. it up they can charge whatever they want you know, your chain stores, they can charge whatever they want. And always stay away from the brown spots in the steaks when you see them and the meat. It starts to turn brown under the wrapper. I right. educated the kids on that. And I'm assuming, oh, is, yeah. that, is that just oxygen getting to the tissues of the beef? It is. It's, and it's getting old. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah and I, that's what goes into your burger. I found out from a butcher, which isn't a real butcher, he's a processor, that they just re-dye their damn meat. They just, is there a, like a dye that they can put on meat when it gets old? I guess there is. There's a lot of things that as you get older, you find out things from inspectors and stuff well, like that. There is a, there, there's a dye that is made out of a certain bug and it's a red dye that is you can put it in meat. Yeah. So are you yeah, telling me there's bugs in some it. old beef? There's bugs in it? There could be. Yeah. Not in new <laughs> not not in New Athens, Illinois, but oh, oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So so look, I I wanted to come to you and get my beef from you mostly because you helped us out and and I figure, you know, I'll turn about is fair play. If somebody helps you out, help them out. So but I, I guess I didn't realize I actually did really good because I probably got healthier beef and probably a much better price than if I had tried to go out and buy what I bought locally. If you went out to the store and bought everything that you bought or took home from me, it would cost you double. So say if you went to Walmart Super Center and bought every okay. cut. That, that don't 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 get don't get too big in the head. You still got to sell it to me for a reasonable price. But are you're not making much on this? You're you're making a living. Yeah, yeah. It's there's a very there's a thin margin when you get it all cut and dried. It's a thin thin margin. Okay, so very very thin. That's all cool. right. 
So yeah. we've just talked about, you know, $7 a pound, and at 7 bucks a pound, there's basically not much left for you, right? You're making a quarter right. out of that 7 bucks. So my question is, how does fast food do it? How do they sell a, sell a hamburger fairly cheap? A any thoughts on that? Well, basically, if you look lately, fast food isn't that cheap anymore. For instance, my buddy that I work with took – him, his wife, and two small children, and it was over to a fast food restaurant, and it was almost $45. Okay, so it's not cheap. It's not cheap. And 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 I don't think it's all that healthy either, but so... <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right. Exactly. So maybe we don't get the health, maybe we don't get the low price, but I'm, I'm, I'm still wondering... Are, are we getting good quality meat out of these fast food restaurants? Is it, the, is it the good stuff that I'm getting from you, or is it? Not even close. Not even close. Okay. It's, no. In other words, I'm comparing an apple and a kumquat. I'm comparing what I'm buying and what I'm paying for and the price I'm paying with what they are when you're saying it's a different product, a different price. Exactly. Different product. Totally different product than what I'm putting out. Okay. So yeah. so when someone says to me, well, if Mako can paint a car for, you know, three grand, five grand, why can't you? I tell them different product, different price. Same thing? Yeah. Same thing. Exact same thing. Okay. Exactly. Fair enough. So I I actually need to go back in time about 20 minutes ago. So I, I, I process a beef and I got 400 pounds in this pile, which yeah. goes into freezer wrap, and I got 600 pounds in this pile. What happens to that 600 pounds? Like, I mean, I'm, I imagine there's a lot of tallow in that 600 pounds, right? Yeah. Oh, what yeah. happens to the tallow? The tallow will go into our rendering barrels, our scrap barrels. The bones will go into the rendering barrels. Okay. So you've got fat, bone going into to the barrels. Well, and 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 I don't know if you remember, and maybe I didn't tell you, but somebody on 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 my beef, they took what I think was the neck vertebrae. It was a chunk about I don't know that long, eighteen inches long, and they yeah. threw it in the in the bucket. Well, I reached in there and grabbed it and threw it in some paper. I took that neck yeah. bone that went into the rendering bucket. And I yeah. brought it home, and I threw it in a pot of water, and I threw some seasoning in it, and some carrots and potatoes. I got to tell you, Red, that was one of the best stews I've ever had. So, oh yeah, why? So, isn't there? I mean, what is the reason for throwing that in the rendering bucket? Is it because it's just too expensive to get the little bit of meat out of it? It's you can't get it all out, unfortunately, and. What that was, that was some of the bones that we will save if people ask us, hey, we want some bones to cook soup up with. Yeah. That is one of the main bones that we'll use to cut up on the saw because it's impossible to pay somebody the time that it would take to get all that meat oh. out of there. So I agree. I wasn't willing to even think about trying, but the boiling water did a tremendous job at doing it all by itself. Oh, absolutely. And nobody wants bones anymore. Nobody takes the time to cook the soup. You know, very one out of 10 people might take their soup bones. I, I, yeah. I got to tell you, that that process of grabbing that neck, because I mean, I'm looking at that beautiful red beef inside all those vertebrae. And so yeah. I thought, I'm not going to let this go to waste. And after I did that, it changed the way I started cooking and processing food. So now if I process an animal and it's just a lot of work to get like the little bits of meat out of the fat, I throw it all into the stew pot. I pull all the fat off. I turn that into um, a, a very rich dog food. You know, I add a little bit of that to my dog food. Absolutely. And then Red, what, what I have now decided to do is I throw no bones away and my dogs don't get them the way they used to. I don't care whether it's chicken, turkey, beef, pork, lamb, goat, whatever. 
I boil all bones until they disintegrate. I throw them in a Vitamix. I blend them up with the, uh, the marrow, all those red blood cells, and yeah. the animals go crazy for it. They think it is the best oh. tasting stuff in the world. Yeah, and basically that's what the rendering company is doing with this stuff. Okay, so they're at least getting something out of it, right? I mean, it's not going yeah. to waste. That's the whole point of it's it's a recycling process. And okay. it's been going on since since they've been started butchering, you know. They've they found a way to make something out of everything. So uh, all right. Nothing so, nothing went to waste. Well, that that makes me feel much better because there is so much I'm going to tell you a little bit of a gross story, but it's kind of a funny story and Brigitte, cover your ears. We decided to have a luau a little while ago. And and as you know, one of the first things you got to get rid of is, you know, the, oh, yeah. the, the teeth, hair, eyes, and all that stuff. So I cut the head of this peg off, you know, and I processed the rest of the peg, and I've got this head sitting on the table. Well, I come out an hour later, and the head's gone. Khaleesi has decided to come up on the table, because I, I did all this in my outdoor kitchen. Khaleesi has grabbed this pig's head and has taken off with it. So I find the pig. I, 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 did, I had to go out and just search for it just to see where it went to. And I found it in my front yard. And at this point, most of the skin is off the pig's head. And what there is is most of the bones, the brain is still in it. Um, a lot of the meat has been chewed off it, but not all. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I'm going to leave it here. The next morning I came out, there was part of the jawbone left. That's it. She had digested every other molecule of that entire pig head. Teeth, hair, eyeballs. The only thing left was the lower mandible and the teeth that were on it. Everything else was gone from the pig. So that actually taught me a very valuable lesson. There is nothing that needs to be wasted on that animal if your yeah. dog, I mean, my dog in less than 18 hours turned an entire pig head into a lower jawbone and, and yeah. got all of those calories for herself. I thought that was amazing. It is amazing. And, you know, that, and I think she's a, a great Pyrenees. Yeah. And yep. yeah, wow, that's a, it's a great snack. But yeah, nothing goes to waste. Good, good. And, oh. Yeah, All right. That's the whole idea. So this 600 pounds drives off in a truck. How much do you get paid for that 600 pounds that goes off in that truck? Zero. You get nothing for it? Nothing. Nothing. In the 70s, about the mid 70s, they were still paying us a penny to two cents a pound for it. Then the 80s came along and it was down nothing. They quit paying us for it. But we were still getting money for the hides anywhere from 30 to 50 bucks a hide okay and now now i'm paying to have hides hauled away and thrown in a dumpster wait wait a second mm -hmm. correct me if i'm wrong but the hide of a beef is leather yeah. boots car seats uh for some people underwear i mean that's what yeah. leather makes, right? Yeah, lederhosen. Yeah, okay. So they're not paying you at all for the for the hides? No, nothing. For probably, oh, I guess close to almost 10 years now. Yeah. Well, what happens to the hides? You said a dumpster. You're not really throwing them in a dumpster, are you? They will go to a landfill. They will go to a landfill. Absolutely. So wait, wait, how many animals, how many cows are you processing on an average month? Just a ballpark. 50. So you're telling me that you meat. have 600 full cow hides a year, 600 going in the landfill. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. All that leather gone. Yeah. Why aren't we re- and I mean, that- that isn't even repurposing. Leather is a highly desired commodity. It is. It is. And it's not just my place. It's all the places around here. The, when this all came down, it was the perfect storm. The EPA was cracking down on the chemicals that it takes 
and the process that it takes to produce leather. You had people squawking about killing animals and wearing fur and and wearing leather and stuff like that. So it 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 was so cost it it the price that it was taking to uh, produce it and not shipping it overseas anymore. You know that hide market has gone by the wayside also. So you've got the perfect storm of stuff happening and the only leather that's being produced is coming out of the big feedlots out west where all the cattle are fed the same way. They're almost all the same size. Basically they're cookie cutter hides and they're, that's what wow. they want. They want them all the same size and that's the only leather they're using. I don't even know where they're getting it tanned at these days. I don't know if there if there's even a tannery in the United States. That seems like an incredible waste. And and it is an incredible waste. You you've just explained to me something. So let me tell you, I I, I contacted this guy on the internet because I, I needed some leather seats for a car. And he advertised yeah. leather seats. And, and in fact, genuine leather seats. So I, mm -hmm. uh, seat covers. So I ordered these seat covers and I get them to the shop and I'm looking at them and you know, the leather looks a little bit different than vinyl. They have a similar look, but they're not the very same. Right. So I, I look at this and I smell and it smells like vinyl. So I flip this seat cover inside out and got to the edge and it's vinyl. There is no leather whatsoever in this leather seat cover. And I called the guy and I said, Hey, I, my name is Dan Short, and I just ordered this leather seat cover. And he goes, oh, yeah, what do you think? And I said, well, you didn't send me a leather seat cover. You sent me a vinyl seat cover. And he goes, yeah, that's the same thing. I said, no, it's not. <laughs> and he goes, yes, it is. I said, no, my friend, let me explain something. Leather is grown by God on the back of a cow, and vinyl is grown in a lab by a human being. And he goes, Oh, well, we consider it the same thing. So I can't even trust an internet purchase of leather because many, many companies now call vinyl leather. And you've just explained why. Because we're throwing all of our leather in the garbage and they got to produce all these car seats and they're doing them all in vinyl. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't even know where they're doing it. Our hides used to go to... Uh Canada for Chrysler seats. I do know that this is years ago, but yeah, now, yeah, yeah. I I don't even know where to go to buy a leather bag. Can you it, still buy leather shoes? I don't know. You you can buy leather shoes, but they'll be made out of vinyl. But I mean, if <laughs> if you're okay yeah. with that, but that's yeah. really happening. A lot of a lot of what is now being sold as leather is made in a laboratory. By some technician and it's one molecule away from you know crude oil but but that's what's being sold as leather all right so um it's a shame uh i red i uh i i butchered and skinned and you know look i i i i i bow to your your skill because you you have forgotten more about you know butchering and skinning and boning and, and, and processing of meat. You forgot more about it since you woke up this morning than I've ever known. But I, I will tell you, I at least try. My, my cuts aren't going to be pretty, but if I get a deer or I, I'm going to process an animal, you know, I, I cut it up and I, I skin it and I, I scald it if necessary, whatever to process it. Um, are, are people doing that these days or like are, are deer hunters? Because... You, I remember you. You sent me a picture one day of your shop, and it was filled with deer heart, deer carcasses. Why is yeah. your shop filled with deer carcasses? You've got people that are only worried about having a good time and drinking beer. They'll go out and kill a deer, and say, "Here it is." They'll bring it to the shop and say, "Here, here it is. You just make me some sausage." You know, they don't want to mess with everything that goes into the skinning. They'll gut it if they're lucky or somebody will gut it for them and then they'll bring it in, but they don't want to worry about the mess. They just want the fun and the kill and the drink and the beer and stuff that goes with it. But I'm not 
I'm talking out of school. That's not everybody. That's just right. certain certain guys. They don't want to mess. They don't want to worry about the mess. Okay, so they don't have a place to process this deer. Most guys, if they brought the deer home and hung it up in the garage or in the backyard, their wives would have a conniption fit, much less their neighbors. You know, yeah, out there with all the blood. And then the neighbor's dog comes over and starts licking the blood and goes home and pukes <laughs> on the front porch. You know, that that kind of a deal. So well, that's why they'll bring it in to the shop. You you, you reminded me of a funny story. I'm, I'm in my backyard. I've got my bobcat. I've got a, a deer hung from my bobcat. And I'm out there with a buddy of mine. And, you know, we had just gutted it. And my son pulls up. Now, his wife is Filipino. And and let me tell you, she'll she'll eat the snake's head. You know, she'll bite the head off a snake. All right, yeah. that's that's the way she was raised. She she has no problem having having part in processing chickens, pigs, anything. My son comes out and and sees us processing. Just all he does is he watches me do some work, and I'm like, hey, grab a knife, and and he's like, oh, I I I can't watch this, and he has to turn and walk away. My son, and, and he's a tough guy, and he can't even watch it. So I, I guess I understand the whole people not wanting to see that happening. But do you think that that's right? Because I, I got this philosophy, if, if you're going to take the life, it should be taken respectfully. In other words, mm -hmm. try for a one-shot kill. Yeah. And, and then ultimately that animal gave its life, but let's face it, the, the, in, in – in the food cycle, I believe that that's why those animals are here. I, I mean, that's yeah. just that's my philosophy on life, right? Pigs, cows, Absolutely. chickens, and deer are here for me to put into my body, and then my body will later feed worms and and trees. That's that's the circle of life, and I'm I'm all about it. Um, yeah. Do you think that if you kill an animal, you really should be the one that processes it? Not. You don't have to be, you know, some people just can't do it. You know, not, but, not everybody. I, 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 can, wait a second. I, I didn't ask you if they can or can't. Should they? What is your opinion? Because my opinion is if you kill it, you better damned process it. Now, that part of it. Yeah. You put it that way. You should be able. You should. Anything you kill, you should be able to skin. You okay. should be able to process it. And okay. that goes for squirrel hunting rabbit hunting anything like that you've got to be able to clean it and take care of it yeah okay I and, definitely and, agree. and and i to me it's almost a respect for the animal yeah if i've taken the animal's life i i i can't turn into a big sissy and say here you take it and deal with it i mean it is my job to turn that into food for my family period correct you should be able to do that what happens if you didn't have anybody to well, do it? And and that's where I was going to go with this is, Red, I'm, I'm all about self-sufficiency, okay? Because mm -hmm. let's face it, if you're not self-sufficient, you're dependent on someone else, probably the government. So, so if, if you kill an animal and you can't process it, why did you bother killing it? That, that's yeah. my philosophy. Exactly. Who's okay. going to do it? All right. So, so... Let me then, now that we've spent an hour on this segue getting to the question, let me ask you the question that I wanted to ask you in the very beginning, but I had to get here to do it. Do you think that what you do, which is your, your profession, you, you take an animal and you process an animal from on the hoof to on the table, do you think that is something that America, which I'm convinced has forgotten how to do, should know how to do if they want to exist in any kind of circumstance that you can think of they should know okay they should know can it be taught yeah it's not a difficult thing to go out and skin a deer or pull the skin off of a rabbit it's not a big deal should you know yeah you should know you yeah. might have to you might have to feed your family someday Look, if, if things got bad, right, whether it's a natural disaster, civil unrest, um, an actual real pandemic, anything like that, and, and you have to hunker down, you, 
you know, that that rabbit, that squirrel, if if I mean it let, let me let me tell you a, a, a quick story of the first time I killed an animal, because I'll admit that the very first time I did it, I've, I've got this rabbit and it was part of my training and to train others, which was the killing quick kill and, and mm -hmm. processing of rabbits. And, and I'll be honest that when when you take this rabbit and you kill it, you're sort of staring at this furry thing with big floppy ears and a little tail and 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 the processing of the fact that that is food isn't completely sort of natural right that no no you, you got to figure out how to remove the skin correctly you got to figure out how to disembowel it without poisoning the meat with with all the bile and everything going into the to the meat right. so <clears throat> so i admit that it wasn't natural the very first time i did it but after I did it that first time, and then I did a chicken, and then it was a, a snake. I've processed snakes. And then I, yeah. you know, ultimately got to the point where I had done pigs and cows and deer. And it, I, I found that it's almost all the same. Oh, I mean, yeah. It is. Technically, it is. You, you kill it, you skin it, clean it, keep it from getting nasties in it when you gut it. You know, keep the bacteria out of it, and it's good. Yeah. And, yeah. and then it's just a matter of how you process it, right? So obviously on right. a cow, you don't want to just tar tearing into it with your teeth. Like a, a right. rabbit, you're going to most likely take a rabbit, put it on a spit, and turn it over a slow fire, and then just eat it sort of like it is. I'm not really going to – I'm not going to turn a rabbit into multiple cuts. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not going to try and get a tenderloin off of a jackrabbit. No, but they're good. Oh, yeah. The tenderloin <laughs> on a jackrabbit is good? Oh, yeah. It's awful little. It's like uh, <laughs> having an omelet made out of a hummingbird's egg. But, you know, it's yeah, it's good stuff. <laughs> OK, well, no, I'll, I'll, no. I, the next time I do a rabbit, I'll I'll try a tenderloin then. And I'll, I'll let that. you know. You try that. No, but you're absolutely right. That's, that's OK. Right. So so for me, the first time I did it, it was a little unnatural. But by the time I had finished it. I started seeing, okay, this is, I, I, I could do this. And, and then the more I do it, the more I realize that although the, it tastes a little bit different and it, it certainly is a different size, uh, whether it's a rabbit or a cow, the process is not really all that much different. No, no, it's all the same. It's trying to keep it as clean as you possibly can. And no, it's, it's, they're basically the same. Keep it clean, then chill it. However, it is that you're going to chill it to to keep it. You know, <clears throat> how are you going to keep that yeah. cold and keep it cool until you cook it? You know, there's got to yeah. be a way to preserve it some way somehow. You've got to get it cooked off or chilled down. All right, you just One said the, the word preservation, and I deal a lot in that. Right, I preserve cars and. I'm I'm trying to preserve my company, Phantom Works, in, in light of this, you know, everybody wanting to go away from motorized vehicles and go to electric vehicles and all this crap. Um, yeah. And, and so yeah. let's just talk about your, your business, your lifestyle. How many generations of lair butchers have there been? That were in business three. Okay. You, three, your father, your grandfather. Correct. Okay, yeah. so you're a three generation butcher shop, and and I ask this question to virtually everyone who has a business today, and unfortunately the answers tend to come back similarly. So the first question is, do you have a kid that you're going to pass your butcher shop on to? Not in my family, but I have a wonderful friend, gentleman, that works for us that will be taking it over from me. Okay, good. So it's not going to stay in the family, but it's at least it's going to stay in existence. Very, very close. As close as you can get to being family without being family. How's that sound? Okay, fair enough. Yeah. All right. What is your biggest challenge today as a butcher to stay in business, just to, to make it through till tomorrow? Number one, the, the same thing that comes up all the time, labor 
finding people to work, finding somebody that that wants to work. And there's not one person that I know or talk to in business, small business, even big business, that they can't find anybody that wants to work. Yeah, you can't hire. And with with what we do, there's getting to be fewer and fewer and fewer small packing plants. And, you know, it's like anything else. It's just like in your business. How long does it take to learn how to uh, to paint a car? You know, how long does it take <laughs> to learn how to do metal work, to teach somebody and be good at it and fast? You know, it takes time. It's the same thing with boning out meat while you were standing there watching us work on your beef as we cut it. It's you, there was a lot of skilled guys there, you know, yeah. and those kind of people don't exist anymore. And it's so, yeah, it's it's such a process to teach. It, it's a it's long sad, process. isn't it? That that everyone wants to become so refined. Red and and I know you've had this happen to you too, but I have actually talked to adult human beings in the United States of America that when I've asked them, where do you think the meat that you're eating comes from. Their answer mm -hmm. was in a package from the grocery store. And I said, but before that, no, that's where it comes from. And, and I'm like, you realize that an animal had to get cut apart for that. And they're looking at me like I'm like, I've got a third eyeball. They don't get it. And I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I've actually had adult human beings in America think that there's some machine that processes this thing that grows inside this plastic package. I, I, I couldn't believe it, but it's actually a real thing. So, so finding people that are willing to do the process gets harder and harder when we have people that don't even understand that that is the process. So yeah, exactly. Okay. That's so, tough. so yeah. that's the problem everyone has micro. I, I love the guy. He talks about it all the time. Um, did, did you know that in the 18 to 25, either 18 to 25 or 18 to 45, male labor pool in America, uh, there are seven and a half million in that group that have chosen not to work. Seven and a half million young men have chosen not to be part of the labor pool. Then how are they existing? That's... You know, and, and that's a complicated answer. I think I understand part of it, but I don't answer, understand all of it. I know they've moved back in with their families. They, they, they pile three and four to a, to a home. They subsist on government welfare, food stamps. 25 to 54 year old, one quarter of them have chosen not to work. So when we talk about our employment, unemployment is 3%. You actually have to add about 8% on top of that to account for them. We really have over 10% unemployment in this country. So in the most significant category of laborers, when you think of welders, fabricators, pipe fitters, butchers, uh, you know, people that do the hard labor jobs, which is typically males from that 25 to 54, we have over 25% unemployment, which is the same as we had in the Great Depression. So without, I, I don't want to get more on my soapbox, but Red, it's a problem. So let's go away from that one. If if you had people, and I'm assuming is, is your problem like mine that up until three years ago, it wasn't too bad, but three years ago, it got real bad? It got, yeah, it like, got real bad. Okay. Real so bad. What's your next problem? Probably, in, sometimes it's the inspection, the inspection laws the, that the government hands down. A lot of the lobbyists, they've got lobbyists, you know, that are connected with the meat packing plants that like to make these laws. And the big packing plants make up, you know, they get the laws made up for the big packing plants. And the little packing plants have to follow all these extra laws, too. Oh. And... It's basically it's they're trying to weed out the little the little guys. It's the same story with a lot of things. I, you know, I, they, I'm, I'm following that. Want, I'm, I don't consider myself a farmer. Not really. I mean, I have a hobby farm, 
but you know I now have cows that I milk. And yeah. I, I, as a result of that, I'm talking with companies that milk and milk processors and things like that. Yeah. And, and basically all the small ones have been driven out of business. And my understanding is we have less than 10% of the dairy farms in this country today that we had just like 20 years ago. I mean, we have oh, yeah. lost 90% in 20 years. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so, absolutely. And it's going to get worse. They don't, they want you coming to them. They, they don't want you going to the little guy. They so, want you to rely on them. Well, and, and I'm not going to say that there is a conspiracy because that would be conspiratorial. But would you sort of agree that maybe, just maybe, if, if I were, in, if, if I were the, the king of the world and I wanted to control the world, it's a whole lot easier to control 100 big companies than 10,000 little companies. And if I've got 100 big companies in the world, they can deal with all the regulations I have because they're big companies and they make enough money. So in other words, regulation and control over 100 big companies might be a whole lot easier than regulation and control of 10,000 little independent shops. Yep, absolutely. You think that might absolutely. have something to do with why all the big companies are driving the little companies out of business? <laughs> Absolutely. It's a lot easier to keep track of everything. A lot easier to keep track of everything. And one of the safest things or one of the safest places that you can buy your meat is going to be from a small mom and pop shop uh, or a small meat pack and plank because chances are they're butchering stuff as I am that's grown locally. Yeah. You know, they're going to be processing stuff like that. If they're a uh, a kill, you know, have a slaughterhouse, they're going to be butchering local beef and cutting it up and selling it. So it's a lot better. And that's another concern is just being able to buy beef local, you know, oh, in my area. I told you, you can't do it here. You cannot buy locally killed, butchered beef in, in my area. And, and if somebody out there knows where it is, please ring me and let me know. Um, uh, I'm easy to find. Just go to phantomworks.com, go to easyhomesteading.com. But Red, I can't find it around here. It doesn't exist. That is crazy. It's, you know, I don't know what the, how many people are raising cattle in your area, but these people have got to go somewhere. I know. And that's what, that's what kills me. I don't know where they're going because I know where I'm going and it's my backyard, but I don't know where they're going. So you know what we need to do? We need to start the plant. Phantom works. Phantom, Phantom. Let's see. What could we call that? I think I, we talked about this before. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, look, I, I, I've got my hands in 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 so many pies right now. Right? We've got a farmers market. We've got a virtual farmers market. We're developing. We're dealing in some level of government contracts. We're doing government grants to try and teach people this stuff. We're doing these podcasts. We're doing the TV show. We're actually negotiating right now with another organization to do a TV show for them. So I, I, I'm not sure I'm ready today to start a butcher shop, but I'll tell you, my cattle will be butchered at my property, period. And, and I, I feed them natural stuff, and I'm going to butcher them in the right way without without introduction of all the wrong things so all right yeah. so so it's a great great concept all right so is is the future bleak because i'll tell you there the future is so bleak for so many small businesses so so number one i'm just let me just put this out if if you have a small butcher near you you have a small dairy please support them because they need your support to stop them from being swallowed up by the big guys because the big guys want, once the big ones are in control look you have no control over pesticides chemicals processes pasteurization uh estrogen <laughs> hormones so so it is it is the guys like you and the little shops all around that really need the support because if we lose you we're we're up the creek without a paddle 
And it's great that you mentioned that because the average people that are coming down down to the shop and the emails that we get from our website where we sell the sausage and the slim gin, you know, the smokies, the little sticks and that they, they love, they love reading the story about the little small mom and pop shops that won't be here. if They don't get the support, yeah. you know, and, and it's all, all whether, no matter whether it's a butcher shop or, a, or a whatever, a, you know, a car restoration shop. It doesn't matter. They, right. You've got to support them. You got to. You, you don't support they, them. They, they go away there. and then 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 you're done. Right. Because because yeah. once the butcher shops are gone, good luck. All right. So Where are you two things. Go? Um, number one, uh, quick shout out for your own place. Give us your website. Give us uh, how we get a hold of you um, for people, because you not only obviously process animals there, most people aren't quite as crazy as I am bringing in, you know, 10 coolers and, and 5,000 pounds of ice to move cows out of your place. So for, for someone who wants the greatest Smokies ever made, how do they get them from you? They can go to our website, directly to our website, and that is called handcraftedsausage.com. And, or they can go to our website, lairsmarket.com. You have to spell and there's Lair. a link that'll L E H R. Okay. Because Lair, normally I would spell Lair like L A R E. So L E H R.com. Oh. Right? No, spell the whole thing for me L E H R S.com. L E H R. L E H R S market market.com. Lair's market.com. Yeah, market. All right. Sorry. We, I almost screwed you up there. All right. And, and no, I need yeah. you to do me a favor. I'm, I'm, we're, our, our website for easy homesteading is in beta, but in the next few days, I'm going to have a shopkeeper registration. And although you're a butcher in mind, because you do, like, you can send out, uh, smokies and um and and sausages and packaged foods that you can actually mail out right correct two things just to clarify we can send the summer sausage it's a vacuum packed it's shelf stable vacuum packed summer sausage and then the little slim jim or smokies smokies are the little bitty round ones those are shelf stable and vacuum packed. Those are the only two things that we can ship. Otherwise, we'd have to send it out in dry ice. So you, you can't ship yeah. cows out. Uh, other than me, you you help me ship cows, but I'm I'm like the only guy, right? If if, if somebody else wanted the you only. to to ship a cow out to them, they could do the same thing I do: drive drive twelve coolers to you with five thousand pounds of ice, and maybe you could help them drive a cow away, right? We could do that. Okay. We can All right. do that. That's easy. So I, I want you to register on my site if you would, which is easyhomesteading.com. Sure. Go to the registration and 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna have somebody call you and get you registered as a shopkeeper. And I'm gonna do what I can to help people find you uh with smokies and sausage and um maybe even to ship a cow someday. And as we do you, I've been telling people about all of the stuff that you guys carry, your Freeze dryers, that just, that's off the hook stuff. That's just yeah, unbelievable. Yep. Great stuff. My, Great my stuff. freeze dryer is running at this very minute, and I've invented a new snack that is absolutely amazing. Let me explain this to you. I start out with Roma tomatoes, and, and I went out and bought all sorts of restaurant equipment. So I can slice 30 Roma tomatoes in about two minutes. No machine. This is all done by hand. And, you know, I just drop them, tap, punch them, and it slices them up. I spread them out on freeze-dryer trays, and I fairly heavily salt and pepper them for the flavor. I throw them in the freezer for 24 hours, throw them in my freeze-dryer for 24 hours. When they come out, I throw them in mason jars, and I vacuum seal the mason jars so that they don't absorb moisture from the atmosphere. My granddaughter comes over, and she grabs this— because. About half of the salt and pepper falls off in the freeze drying process. She takes mm -hmm. these tomato chips and she dips them in the ranch dressing that we made with our own buttermilk. 
our own um, mayonnaise that we make um, and our own seasonings. So she dips our tomatoes into our ranch dressing, and that girl can eat a quart bottle of tomato chips in one sitting, and she is three years old. It is her favorite snack. So, and, and, and it's healthy. It is just tomatoes, oh, eggs, and, and everything is, is organic. There's no chemicals in anything. She loves them. So. One of the best things I ever had was out of the freeze dryer was the fruit. Absolutely off the hook. Yeah. Off yeah. the hook. It's All the flavor just, and none of the weight. People don't, and people don't realize, you know, how long, how long does it last? When you freeze dry that stuff, you know, it's if it's an awesome snack. If you vacuum seal, it can go up to 50 years in vacuum sealed mylar. I mean, mylar. think about right. it, Red. In 50 years, are either of us going to care? Not really. Yeah, not I'm not really, going to. But somebody, but somebody after us might care. That, it'll, my grandchildren will be old in 50 years. You know what I mean? So... So, so in any case, look, um, yeah. right. I've had a lot of fun. I hope you uh, have had, uh, I, I, I learned a lot today. Look, I knew more than most about butchering because I've hung out in your shop, but I actually mm. didn't understand just how little of the beef is left and just how little the margins were for a butcher. So, so to sum it up, you start with a thousand pounds, you end with 380. You, by time you take this animal, you build your shop, you kill it, you skin it, you gut it, you hang it, you process it, you package it, you label it, you refrigerate it and get it ready for the client to pick up. You're, you're bringing in a whopping total of about 25 cents a pound on that. And, 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 and I know with enough volume, 25 cents adds up. But at the end of the day, I don't think you're getting rich off of this, are you? It's it's not as much as people think it is. And anybody that thinks that it isn't true, let them go out and kill one on their place and cut it up and try it. Oh, I and see see what happens. I yeah, have discovered. Anybody doesn't. I, I'm sorry. It it is so much cheaper to have you do it than me do it because when I do it. I mean, believe me, I'm spending several thousand dollars in labor and time and effort to process my animal, but it, it's my time because I'm nowhere near as efficient as you. I ain't processing an animal for $300 worth of labor. And, and kids need to see that. Yes. You know, otherwise it's going to be gone. It's going to be lost forever. If these kids, your grandkids, my grandkids don't see this stuff, they're not going to know. They're not going to, they're going to be like the guy that thought the packaged meat had no idea where it came from. You know? Yeah. They're, it's going to be gone. They they won't know how to process. They won't know how to skin a deer or it's, nothing. It's, so it's, you've it's, got to teach them. It's very sad. The, the state of the adult in America that doesn't know how to do anything except pick up this and ask it a question. If it, if it can't be answered by this, they don't know how to do it. And that's to me, it's a, it's a sad thing. And, and, and the more people we can bring into the fold, the better. So, Red, I'm going to thank you very much. And by the way, I'm going to say one final parting comment. You are an extremely well-dressed man today. I just wanted to, to say that. I mean, that 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 looks damn I, good on you. I, I don't know where I the sleeves are. Uh, I, I told you, I cut them all off. I had to have something for a handkerchief. So, that's... Wow, <laughs> you're blowing snot on my it, sleeves. All right, I'll, I'll accept that. It's tough to... It's tough in Illinois. Yeah, Illinois is a is a tough state. You've got a governor that that needs some help. Don't get me started. Yeah, all right. I'll let that one go. I I saw I had a front page article that showed me what that man did and I thought it was a joke. I thought it was a sick joke and it turns out it's true. So, um brother, I feel sorry yeah. for you oh, yeah. because what you've got there is a problem. And it might be a national problem someday. Let's hope not. Let's, let's hope not. Let's pray that that doesn't happen. All right, brother, we're oh, going to sign no. off. Um, 
Thank you for having me, brother. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. pleasure. I hope they get something out of it. And if they want more, we'll give them some more next time. There you go. Thank you. And uh, Godspeed and God bless. Same to you guys. Great to see you. Today, I, I want to thank you for joining me. I, I had a great time talking with Red, um, a man that uh, sort of helped us out in a sticky situation while we were on Route 66, introduced me to an entire new world of what truly fresh, organic, um, wonderful cuts of beef, pork um, are supposed to taste like. And uh, he, he sort of brought me back to what it would be like to, to eat like our ancestors, eat like we're supposed to eat. Um, uh, I, I get a chance to catch up with Red every once in a while. He lives a long way away. I mean, New Athens, Illinois is not exactly um, our next door neighbor, but uh, um, always great to catch up with him uh, on this particular podcast. I, I learned quite a bit. I Look, I, I knew some of it. I've spent a little bit of time in his butcher shop, but just the the unbelievable i mean a thousand pounds goes down to 380 and and at the end of the day he's making 25 cents a pound on on beef and that's if nothing goes wrong uh uh we didn't talk about it today but he called me up on a few occasions hey another one escaped and is running around in town and uh then he calls me up two weeks later never found the cow that ran away i mean that that actually happens and and he as the butcher gets to pay for that so um uh as a former shop uh owner he and i face some of the same trials i've never had a car run away from me but i have had some problems that sort of showed up in the middle of the night so um thank you for joining us please join us again on all things phantom works and our next guest well um gonna be a surprise to both of us so uh, i hope you'll join us for that <laughs>